Yeah, sure. I was wondering, um, so there's this like girl in the dorm and me and some friends have been talking and we're not really sure what to do. Do about what? Well, she kind of smells and we weren't really sure if we could like tell her, you know, that she should maybe take a shower or something. I mean, it's always good to be direct to people about things. It certainly never occurred to me that the girl in the dorm that needed to take a shower, the one they were talking about, was of course me. Aristotle's and Plato's works are aligned very well together. Um, they both use the same syllogisms for the most part in their uh, character virtues and uh, virtues of knowledge. Um, in it, in it uh, he mostly focuses on kind of defined by um, a median between two different points. Uh, for example, you have courage uh, being in the middle. Uh, one extreme is cowardliness, and then the other extreme uh, would be rashness, almost to the point of suicide. Um, Aristotle talks about character of virtue. Yes, question. What is the highest good? The highest good is uh, happiness, and happiness, as Aristotle defines it, is um, being a virtuous person, um, both in character and in knowledge. Um, going back to characters of virtue, uh, he gives a list of about 20 virtues uh, that people should aspire towards. But then at the end, he comes back and says that uh, knowledge is the most important uh, virtue. At the same time that my mind was starting to betray me, it was also becoming the source of enormous satisfaction. Beyond the narrow and disappointing world of the undergraduate social system that had no place for me, I discovered academia, great ideas, high aspirations, and people whose own intellectual curiosity seemed to give them a real purpose in the world. In particular, I discovered philosophy and fell in love with it. To my great delight, I actually found I was good at it too. My grades were excellent, my classmates sought out my opinion, and my professors welcomed me into their offices to talk about what I was studying or to continue conversations begun in class. As my own graduation approached, I knew I had to make some decisions. For four years, I had a perfect academic record. In fact, I was named class valedictorian. I'd taken sufficient Greek language courses to read Aristotle in the original, and I decided that I wanted to do further study on him. So after consulting with my academic advisors, I decided to apply to Oxford for graduate study. After graduating from Vanderbilt University, I returned home for the summer. I was completely distraught the entire flight back. Transitions were always hard for me. I was happiest with a predictable routine that I had devised and controlled, but this seemed overwhelming. The Vanderbilt libraries, the campus grill, the building buildings and sidewalks, they all gave a precise order of manageability to my life and was now over. At the end of the summer, I boarded a plane to Washington, D.C. There I would meet other Marshall Scholars at the British Embassy, and then we would continue our way to Oxford. Despite our common language, it's no secret that England and America are vastly different countries. Sunny, open, Latin-tinged moors of Miami combined with the Old South graciousness of Vanderbilt seemed a world away in the far older and more courtly enclaves of Oxford. It's wrong to talk. I have nothing to say. I am nobody. I am nothing. You don't deserve to talk. Keep quiet. As I grew steadily more isolated, I began to mutter and just to myself while walking down the street, something I had never done on my worst days at Vanderbilt or in Miami the summer before. When I heard the sounds I was making, I felt neither disturbed nor surprised. For some reason, it helped me feel calmer. It seemed to provide an arm's length distance between me and the people who were walking past me. Oddly enough, it was soothing, much like clutching a well-worn blanket might have been to a frightened child. And so, with no reference point outside my head, I began to live entirely inside it. Was it real? Was it not? I couldn't decipher the difference. It was exhausting. I could not concentrate on my academic work. I couldn't understand what I was reading, nor was I able to follow the lectures. And I certainly couldn't write anything intelligible. So, I would write something unintelligible, just to have a paper in hand each time my tutor and I met. Understandably, my tutor was flummoxed. This is not acceptable, Miss Sachs, he said. He was neither angry nor cold, but he was somewhat disbelieving. Surely you can agree, he asked. But you see, the work here is hard to make any sense of. Yes, I said. Yes, I know. I just didn't know what to do about it. I made one new friend from America, a woman named Jean. She was studying in London. We met on a cigarette break in the bathroom at the British Embassy. How are you doing, Ellen? I'm doing okay. I'm all right. You don't sound okay. I'm just having a hard time keeping up with the required work. You should really see a doctor. What? You should see a psychiatrist. Why don't you see Richard when he comes in town next week? Okay. Jean and I are very concerned about you. We think you may be quite sick. Would you mind if I asked you some questions? I'm not sick. I'm just not smart enough. But questions. Ask me questions. Are you feeling down? Yes. Loss of pleasure in daily activities? Yes. Difficulty sleeping? <laughs> yes. Loss of appetite? Yes. How much weight have you lost in the last month? 
About 15 pounds. Uh, do you feel like a bad person? Yes. Tell me about that. Nothing to tell, I'm just a piece of shit. Are you thinking of hurting yourself? Yes. You need to consult a psychiatrist right away. You need to be on antidepressant medicine. You're in danger, Ellen. Pills? Something chemical to go into my body and muck about with it? No, that would be wrong. That's what I'd been taught at Operation Reentry, and that's what I believed. My father's voice, pull yourself together, Ellen. There would be no drugs. Everything was up to me. And me wasn't worth much. I'm not sick. I'm just a bad, defective, stupid, and evil person. Memories are visitations. They make certain points. The point is on your head. Have you ever killed anybody? This was a joke, right? Ellen, what are you talking about? Oh, the usual heaven and hell. Who's what? What's who? Hey, let's go on the case. This is the real me. Come to the front of the tree with me. We're gonna make limits. What's the matter with you guys? I don't know if you're having the same experience of words jumping around the page as I am. I think someone's infiltrated my copies of the cases. You've got to case the joint. I don't believe in joints, but they do hold your body together. I, uh, I have to go. Uh, me too. My head is too full of noise, too full of lemons and law memos and mass murders that I will be responsible for. I have to work. I cannot work. I cannot think. Professor, I really think I need an extension on this. You know, the, the memo materials have been infiltrated. They're jumping around. People put things in and say it's my fault. I used to be God, but then I got demoted. I'm, I'm concerned about you, Ellen. I, I have a little bit of work to do. Um, That's okay, I'll be on the roof until you're done. One of my students is on the roof and she's mentally unstable. We need help now. People are trying to kill me. They've killed me many times today already. I discover a nice long nail, six inches or so, and slide it into my pocket. You never know when you'll need protection. New Haven PD! His whole team of goons swooped down and grabbed me. But this is the worst ever. Strapped down, unable to move, and doped up, I can feel myself slipping away. I'm finally looking powerless. Oh, look there, on the other side of the door, looking at me through the window. Who is that? Is that person real? I'm like a bug, impaled on a pin, writhing helplessly, while someone continues to contemplate tearing my head off. Yes. 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 Yes.